did you feel that it's actually artificially creating like alienation like this just that feeling of hopelessness is being amplified by these same systems i think it's 50 50. i think yes it is isolating people by putting them into much more distinct groups by allowing you you can find anyone on the internet you can find a group for anything that's a good thing you can also find a group for anything which is a very bad thing in some cases it's why things like QAnon have taken root. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, I can find someone that will touch my brain in the right way, and now I have something insane to believe in. And the conservative media and conservative influencers are just fucking better at it. Uh, welcome to the show, Ed. First time, but a long time thank fan. You, thank you for having me. Oh, thank you. Um, I had a couple of questions that I wanted to ask you, being an expert on AI, uh, the internet and uh, all all those wonderful things. Uh, if you don't know everybody, by the way, this is Ed Citron. He is a author and a very powerful blogger, I might say. I'm a big fan of a lot of your articles, especially the ones on the rod economy, which uh, oh, I'm yeah. to explore a little bit today. Um, I wanted to ask you, why does the internet suck now? It's because all the incentives got messed up. That really is the fundamental part of it. If you look at the original paper for Google from like 1994, 1994, it's within the mid to late 90s. Sergey Brin, Larry Page, they said from the very beginning, advertising is antithetical to good search. It is something that the more you lean towards advertising and anything related to data, the less likely it is you're going to provide a good service. They're completely right. And the reason I always choose Google as the best example is because it's laid out there very well. You can see over time how Google has gone from a relatively bland, straightforward search engine to something that now mostly tries to trick you into clicking stuff. But the overall thing is, is that most of the internet is based on selling you ads. And most people don't want to look at things they're not looking for. They want to see the things they came to see. So the internet has basically become the interruption economy. It's all about getting in your way, getting in the way of the service you were there for. Except... 20 years after that paper they've gone so far down the tube that most services are just bad most services are actively hostile toward the user instagram facebook being two other examples go on there and try and look for stuff that you want to go try and look for the people you're following you're going to see them once every five posts you go on there it's a reel of stuff maybe someone you were looking for add Maybe a person you follow, sponsored ad person, sponsored ad. It's insane. Like a third to a half of everything you see on there is sponsored content. And while you can say, oh, I just want to see the things that I want to follow, they bury that setting as far as they can. And it sucks. It sucks because it's nothing to stop them. They make hundreds of billions of... I think it was Instagram alone makes $32 billion, like $30 billion a year, Google search is over half of Google's $130 billion a year revenue. These businesses are insanely healthy, and they're always getting healthier because they just, fuck you, they just, they just get <laughs> it between aren't, you aren't and the, the things you want to do. the operating costs incredibly expensive for a lot of these? Like, I've always heard that, like, Alphabet acquired YouTube. YouTube doesn't turn a profit, even though it makes, you know, billions of dollars in ad revenue. The cost of the servers and everything is so expensive to try and counteract that. Like, isn't our value think... really in our data? Isn't, isn't that where the true value comes from? I mean, YouTube's incredibly po profitable now. Google has an entire cloud empire that I wouldn't be surprised that they built specifically to help with this problem. Mm. But if you think about it, their only real operating cost is hosting and algorithmic stuff. They don't make anything. These guys are all different kinds of landlords. And when you look at YouTube, yes, it is expensive to run, but not as expensive as... Uh, well, not as... It, the expenses do not outweigh the massive amounts of money. I think they make several billion dollars in revenue from YouTube. But for the most part, the data that they make money on is finding ways to interrupt you. It's finding ways to say, they might want to look at this. This is approximating what they've looked at before, the people they follow, the people they... It's funny, all of the stuff, all of those signals you give them, like, I want to follow this person, they don't really use that to serve you things you're looking for. They're just like, oh yeah, that means we can show them this and maybe they'll like it who gives a shit what they're going to do not use instagram mm -hmm. but doesn't that come down to the data then is is that not also oh, yeah. valuable to, to the to sure but 
it's not like when you when people say like selling data or monetizing data they can mean something completely different so yeah they do make money off of having those signals and having that data you're right but they don't they can sell it but it's more of an intermediary approach like facebook the amount of data they have on you is upsetting when you really think about it and that data isn't really something they sell to people cambridge analytica was actually a big 2018 problem or 2016 that thing was they were basically funneling the data to Cambridge Analytica, which is what something they didn't intend to do. Sure, it was a big mistake, a big accident. But for the most part, what they do is allow people to hyper-target you. That's why ads follow you around the internet, from Instagram to Facebook, to Google to other websites. They make money off of that. They don't tend to send your pure data, like who you are, where you are. Other companies do that. Intellio, Spokio, uh, you can access these things through things like being verified. That's what really scares me. That scares me so much more. So, sorry, who's Atelio and Spokio? They are data brokers. Okay. So, terrifying fact. If I had your first name and your last name and where you lived and roughly your age, I could probably find out your entire history. I could find out most of the things that you have done, the places you've lived, your associates, marriage, bankruptcies, crimes, all that good stuff. Crimes are kind of walled off because state-based information is a little tougher to get to. But these data brokers make billions of dollars just selling your actual data, your actual email addresses, social media profiles, pictures of you. There's a company called, crap, what's it called? Well, Clearview AI, the one used by the disgusting cops. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a, oh, what is that called? They actually have a web portal that allows you to put an image in and it will search for that person and tell you who it is. It's Pim Eyes is what that's, it's called. That's creepy. And this so wait, is the every, creepy stuff. So that so everyone has public access to this? Like, if I wanted to right now, I could go you could, and, and access, you have uh, access to pay. Pimai's. Okay, you have to pay. So Pim, but, but Pimai's cost fee, money. But is, yeah. is this is the case. So you're describing the kind of things that I assume, like, uh, police agencies have access to or, or you know, the, the FBI or CIA or something. They have a level up version. They have, oh, okay. I forget exactly what it's called, but it's like the LEO version. They're able to access a level down. They're able to centralize crimes, for example. It's much easier to find arrests. But even then, depending on where you're arrested or what happened, that may be buried within state authorities. But yeah, for about 25, 30 bucks a month, you can get these services. You can look people up. There are ways to remove yourself from them. A company called Abin sells a service uh, called Delete Me that deletes you from them. Still okay. takes months. You're still That's... leaving these little trails and you have no control over how these get out there. It's insane. And, and so these companies operate exclusively to be able to data mine on everyone? That's that's their entire profit motive? Data mine suggests a lot more effort. They just oh. take it. They buy it from marketing agencies. They buy it from some credit card companies, more scurrilous ones, insurance companies. Lots of companies just sell this data. And then there are, of course, the multiple times the, the leaks happen. And these companies... These companies like being verified, they don't give a shit. They'll take it from anywhere. And then they'll be like, whoa, whoa, we found you on the dark web. You should give us money to help you get off the dark web, which they cannot do. Right. Just like no ability to do. Oh, wow. Well. Okay, so that makes me feel a little bit like Ron Swanson where I want to like smash all my computers and stuff. <laughs> but... Oh, it's too late. It's too late. Okay, fine. All right, then I accept it. Every everyone knows everything about everything. Well, else. but you can also try and delete. Right. You can yeah, actually yeah, yeah. get in there and pay these things. It's stupid that you have to. This but is why I feel insane all the time, because <laughs> this stuff is just happening. But it's n none of it's being used for, say, any kind of beneficial purposes. Like, the, there's no good for humanity here. Like, this is exclusively to be able to just really want to stalk someone. Yeah, that's that's the. But that's, that's not the a good thing. Yeah. And what's crazy is, yeah, most cops, private detectives, um, pretty much anyone in anything adjacent to law enforcement can get the step up. Wow. Um, and then if a lawyer can use LexisNexis, get even more, great. Get it's, access all, it's all good. Okay. All right. Well, rolling it back for one second, back to the social media itself that we use. You're saying mm -hmm. that a lot of it is, is basically this downward spiral where they've been prioritizing ad revenue or at least the advertiser profitability experience right for for their yes. side um does that coincide with the changes that we've seen that 
like it seems like most of these companies and and these apps specifically they all try to emulate each other and i've always looked at that from a monopolistic standpoint everyone wants to be an everything app right like it makes sense that instagram wants to be tiktok and youtube wants to be instagram slash tiktok right that's why reels and shorts and all these other variants of each other pop up is is that also contributing towards it like is is the whole idea to try and uh out compete every other single possible app for your time uh in order to feed you more ad in most cases, if you look at the history of like Google, Facebook, and I mean Microsoft to an extent, but Microsoft was so bad at it, they've all tried to do everything the other has done. Google tried social networking with Google Wave. They were so fucking bad at it. They were so bad that they just went, no, because making the social network sucks. A mm -hmm. functional social network is a bad business. Like it just does not make money. Right. You have to, app.net tried to do a paid one in the mid 2010s, didn't work. So they, what, the reason that you'll see similar mechanisms, like very heavy handed algorithms, is because don't, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Iterate on what works. TikTok is just a more aggressive version of the already existent Facebook algorithms. Mark Zuckerberg has been trying to copy that algorithm. That's why Instagram sucks so bad, because Mark Zuckerberg walked into the not. Adam Masseri's office with a gun and put it to his head and said, more traffic! <laughs> and, well, more engagement at least. Yeah. But it is these funnels we're being put into. They're all a result of just trying to optimize every user's activity. Like, that is that is any commonalities you see is because they're all trying to do the same thing. They're all trying to say, this user... We want them to do what we want. And it used to be, okay, we kind of lovingly shove them. Or we give them a tap here and they might do this. Uh, Twitter did a very good job of this where they occasionally slide a post in there and people get so pissed off. They slide a fucking post there. You want to see, what do you think of this? Do you like this? Maybe you follow them. Hmm? And that actually worked pretty well for Twitter. Mm -hmm. Then Instagram and Facebook said, what if we didn't apologize if we just did it to them? And that's why a lot of tech feels like it's happening to you. Mm -hmm. Does that contribute to the feeling that a lot of people have that everything is so much angrier now? Like, I, I wonder yes. how much of it is actual AI, how much of it is algorithms, and how much of it is just the, the polarization of, like, society or politics in general. So I think there's a few things there. I think that Threads especially, when it started, was a very aggressive, engagement-optimized algorithm. So whatever was popular was what got made popular. So if something was pissing people off... Top of the fucking charts. There was so much transphobia on there. Adam Masseri should be slapped with a big fat wet fucking fish. I hate that guy for many reasons, but he allowed such vile transphobia on that platform. Nobody in the fucking media said shit. I was so angry. Anyways. But I actually believe that most people should not be thinking about politics as much as they are. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that people shouldn't think about politics, but I feel that social media, especially that juiced with algorithmic stuff, makes the effects of politics so much more immediate and then you get this big distance between how much you can actually do and what's happening so you're very aware and it's always been like this kind of of how much power these people have and how little you have and yes you can you can um advocate for causes you can donate to causes you can protest you should do the, these are all valuable things i'm not discounting that but I think the average person does not have enough industry or capacity to read enough to work out how they can actually affect change. And thus they sit there and they're like, what if I post? What if I just post all day? What if I read so sources that back up my biases, which are then reinforced by algorithms? Because the algorithm says, oh, this, this guy really seems to like insane guys. <laughs> insane guys with terrible opinions. Let's, let's see if he'll like this guy who's also insane and so yeah it is it's a mixture of things and the polarization of people yeah i think is social media but i also think it's just the inevitable consequences of everyone having access to everything mm -hmm. do, you, do you do you feel that it's actually artificially creating like alienation like this just that feeling of hopelessness is being amplified by these same systems i think it's 50 50 i think yes it is isolating people by putting them into much more distinct groups, by allowing you, you can find anyone on the internet. You can find a group for anything. That's a good thing. You can also find a group for anything, which is a very bad thing in some cases. It's why things like QAnon have taken root. Mm -hmm. Because 
yeah, I can find someone that will touch my brain in the right way, and now I have something insane to believe in. And the conservative media and conservative influencers are just fucking better at it. They are just better than people on the left or even the center at doing this. They're better at creating controversy. They have worked out the mechanisms of the internet better than anyone on the left because they don't care. They don't care about being right. They don't care about being truthful. They just fucking go for it. And they don't have to issue corrections in most points, too. No, they don't give a shit. What are are you going to do? Are you going to tell the manager? Are you going to tell Ben Shapiro? Hey, Ben, (laughs) I don't think you were fair here. (laughs) <laughs> the, all of the thing that especially a lot of the liberal media has is they're like, oh, oh I've got I to gotta be honest. I've got to be objective. And you should be. You should be honest. But at the same time, if you fuck up, don't take a step back and say, oh, I'm so sorry. No, forward. These people are evil. Fucking treat you, evil with anger. Do you think the only way for the left to compete with that is to, like, it, it sounds profoundly unethical to do what they do right so i don't think there can be a response from the left that isn't on some level maybe like a grift of some kind i think that you're right in that you can't completely emulate it but at the same time there is a room for a lot more aggressive reporting like look at the intercept which is falling apart as it speaks they've done great work from that level ken Mm -hmm. klippenstein has actually done he he is a good example of someone who operates in policy of truth but also he does not back down he is well informed he is direct he does not jump to the bait that's more what i'm talking about this whole npr thing for example this yuri bellend i don't know his second i'm not going to find it his whole thing is he went well wokeness has taken over npr the actual response here should have been who gives a shit Hmm. nobody cares no, it should have been treated with, if not derision, the level, there should not, this should not be New York Times news. This is not an actual thing. This is one guy going, ah, ah, wokeness, and then the actual fundament of the story is actually NPR was helping Donald Trump the whole time. It's just, at the very least, can the left and the center just be a little bit better at seeing what's happening? When you said that's, right there, though, that the key is not to, like, what Ken Klippenstein does well is he doesn't buy or, or maybe take the bait. Um, yeah, the you, bad faith you, tactics. Yeah, can you, can you uh, explore that more? Because I'm, I'm curious. So look at, look at the Harvard, the, the Harvard situation, Claudine Gay. Yeah, like, Claudine, Claudine Gay. Gay. Yeah. yeah. That whole thing, that should have been, everyone should have said, this is fucking weird, and left it alone. It should never, it was not a story. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, it, one story on it, fine, I can accept that. But endless stories about fairness at Harvard have like an actual audience of like 12 people. It is unimportant. It was made important by virtue of the fact that everyone reported on it. If everyone just said, this is bad faith nonsense, who gives a rat shit? But because everyone's locked in this weird Zionist dance, well, we must back Israel no matter how many children they murder. Fucking hell. Sorry, that whole thing makes me quite angry. Um, Me as well. But that's, that's one of these situations where... It should have been treated with derision. It should have been Bill Ackman, an insanely rich guy, is trying to do a big dance. The story there is rich guys are trying to interfere with the media. It's not about plagiarism. It's, that was just slightly more grown-up Gamergate. Mm-hmm. Except, thankfully, yeah. less people of color were hurt, I think. Though, then again, if you think of it, it it's just these bad faith attacks, they are not particularly sophisticated, and yet left or center-left publications continually fall for them. Well, I was going to say, isn't that the problem, though? It's usually, like, it's liberal, I find, publications at the worst to fall for, like... I think Christopher Rufo admitted that he was openly planting that story, and as he was actively doing that, people like Jake Tapper were buying it, and then just, and then publicizing it, and, and, and promoting it. Like, that, that to me, is, is, is way more effective at creating what you're describing than, say, like, a couple leftist streamers who were like, yeah, this is about wokeness, or, yeah, maybe there is a war on but, that. But the thing is, legitimize. you know what? You're completely right. It really isn't... When I say the problem is the designations that the left, liberal, yeah, center, yeah, yeah, they're yeah, very right. confusing. Yeah. But, <laughs> but I think you're right. In the, while we can say it's influencers or streamers or whatever, the people failing are people like the New York Times. Right. They yeah. are the one, Jake Tapper, they're the yeah. ones falling for this nonsense. I actually think oh, Chris Hayes does a really good yeah. job. Chris Hayes has been like on MSNBC. Never thought I'd be saying it, but MSNBC does a good job with this shit. Chris mm. Hayes is completely. He refuses to buy this shit, and he is damning about it. That is the model to follow. Bill Ackman should have been laughed out of the room. It is not a story. I'm so sorry. 
I don't mm. the whole thing, the Neri Oxford thing as well that followed was just like everyone should have laughed at them. But mm. there were like there were like eleven, twelve stories in the New York Times about this Harvard thing. None of this is important, and all it's doing is getting a person of color fired and suppressing the voices of Palestinians, and also making a rich and popular popular influential guy more rich and influential, giving him a what that New York magazine piece. This is the thing. Chris Rufo's out there going, yeah, I'm absolutely doing this. I am manipulating the media right now. Watch this. Hey, just checking in again. I just manipulated the media again. This is what my intention was, and look what happened. A big success, I'd say. And New York Times says, oh, we better make sure we include him, though. <laughs> no. No. Why include him? Yeah, Why include this fucking guy? Why include any of these people? It, it, when you know someone is acting in bad faith, you treat them as such. Mm -hmm. And I think the this is an entirely separate problem to the algorithm, except the algorithm plays into it because the right fucking loves these ginnied up, meaningless campaigns. They love it. Something to be mad at, something. And the only way to beat them is to ignore them, to not react, to, to not but it's so show tempting. any interest in it. Tucker Carlson's talking about fucking candy. I want to talk about that. It's funny. <laughs> oh, it is. And that's the thing. <laughs> yeah. That's the problem. No, no, I'm, I'm being facetious. Of, like, I, I totally no, but I agree also, with you. Yeah. But also, <laughs> if you want to make fun of Tucker Carlson, Kat Abu does a great job of that, or did a great job of that back, back in the day. Now she does it more generally with Fox. She does a good job because she sits there and says, here's, here's what they've said, and kind of points to the ridiculousness, and then just goes, what do you think? Great journalism. Straightforward. Mm -hmm. Media Matters does excellent work. Brendan over there as well does excellent work cutting up clips. Very, very good guy, Brendan Garrett. That's the kind of thing you need to do. You need to show these people for how ridiculous they are. But ultimately, the mass media needs to stop operating as the PR firm for the right wing's talking point of the day. Because when that happens, it enters the algorithm, it spreads it out, it further polarizes people because the platforms have absolutely no interest in moderating this content. But even if they did, look at the coverage. It fucking sucks. Like, it sucks. It, it, all, it makes me very angry. Because there's so little you can do about it, but the solutions are so obvious. Also, the New York Times needs to shut down its opinion page. <laughs> Just do shut not, it down. Do you not feel sometimes that, like, what would you say for if there is a surplus of all this right-wing outrage bait, and there is, but that stuff dominates algorithmically on YouTube, Facebook. Like, you can see the Daily Wire, for example. Top 10 of all the Facebook searches are usually Daily Wire-related hosts and stuff like that, right? If they're putting out this kind of trash, rage bait, you know, oppression simulator-style content, um, is that not just going to dominate and create this echo chamber if there's not people who are responding with, you know, direct refutations of it? From say it's a gonna, leftist perspective, it's gonna happen. But guess what? If uh, if absolutely nobody responded to it, or the response was tepid, mm -hmm. they would keep trying until they found something that worked. But making them keep trying is important. They cannot giving them auto coverage is the problem. But also, yeah, I think that YouTube probably needs to stop putting Daily Wire stuff out. Mm -hmm. That fucking outlet has done enough damage as it is. They have so many reasons. The crowders on there, right? I, I tend to not uh, yeah, watch this. With, within slightly limited capacity, but he is still on there. He doesn't but upload even association, all shows, but... association with these people is just, it's, it's shit. It's dog shit. They should not be boosting it. And the argument is, well, that's censorship. It's censorship. You can't, you can't cut these people off. Well, guess what? Facebook already does censorship. YouTube already does censorship. How about fucking evil people? campaigning for for the uh the rights of trans people to be removed how about get that out of there punish them for it oh you can't be the arbiter of content yes you can why not you already are you already are this is yeah. this is the thing people always have this argument well if, if you do that it's censorship you can't possibly censor people they're already doing it they're already censoring the internet just in a way that's slightly harder to point at when i open up facebook it is censorship it is it is them saying, no, you can't look at this. You must look at this. This is what we want you looking at. That is censorship. Mm -hmm. Good, bad, I mean, doesn't really matter. And a, guess a, what? No, go ahead. Well, I was going to say that's a great way to segue into asking you about Elon Musk because he takes over Twitter 
and I think this is kind of maybe a, a really hyper, you know, almost crystal meth tier version of a lot of what you're talking about. Because someone who is like openly said he's going to change the algorithm, go goblin mode, quote, right? Uh, and then we noticed there was that new tab, the the for you or whatever. It seems mm -hmm. to be very blatantly, obviously, doing exactly what you're talking about, just in a way in, in which is not subtle at all. It's like you click on it, and then it'll show me ten of the weirdest weirdos saying the weirdest things I've ever seen, and then I have this instant need uh, to to respond right to be like oh my god you know and then the, the, like and i assume all by design yeah the for you tab's interesting because yes he obviously is prioritizing right wing guys but guess what there's a lot more of them <laughs> there's just there's a lot more of them on there because he's the they are doing the nazi bar thing it is mm -hmm. they're it's happy, we're paying nazis they paid fucking andrew tate mm -hmm. accused sex trafficker they gave him like tens of thousands of dollars Given those worms, the Krasensteins, what politics do they have? The answer is, whichever they need to for that day. <laughs> what the, the truth is with Twitter is, it is not a particularly advanced or complex algorithm because he fired all the people behind it. Right. He fired all the people. And Twitter is hilarious. I was going to say it rocks. It's objectively terrible. But I'm also, I have the, the steel wheel of, if I see something that's engagement bait, I just walk away. Don't mm. respond to peer pressure built different i guess but <laughs> what's say. funniest about twitter is if you look at it and look at every change as imagine elon musk texting someone at 3am and be like okay so i um what i believe is the uh, we need to make sure that whenever someone says epic it it flashes the entire <laughs> screen flashes and some poor fucker is like 3am like yeah sure you're like well i don't i don't care don't I, do i've got an h1b i've got to stay here and it's hilarious because the site is falling apart and it's mm. falling apart because he wants it to be like a Instagram style growth engine, but he's so fucking bad at business. He's terrible at this Twitter. He, on top of him doing the anti-Semitic post and the racist post telling people to go fuck themselves. It's just a bad product. Now mm -hmm. I am literally looking at Twitter right now. And there is a thing from the children's health defense. One in 36 children in the U S is diagnosed with autism. The CDC is promoting April as Autism Acceptance Month, but we don't accept the refusal by our taxpayer-funded public health agencies to investigate the causes behind this epidemic. What do you think that's about? <laughs> like, like that's the thing. This is what this is. These are the only people they can get now. And Twitter is just, I do agree, it is the crystal meth version in that it's very intense and extremely unstable. And. And he would love it to be a growth engine, but it's falling apart because social networks are shitty businesses and you need to be, you need a lot of people and they need to be good to even make the horrible ones work properly. Because on top of all the bad shit you see on Facebook, and I did a, um, did a newsletter about this recently, about how like Facebook and Instagram are quite broken. The ads are very scammy. They're just as bad as Twitter's. There was one that I found where it was comparing the vaccine to the Holocaust. Hmm. Like, that bad? Okay. Facebook and Instagram full of this shit. But below that is just this horrifying substrate of, like, child abuse, beheading, shit like that that never makes it there. Because they have people, they pay, like, $2 an hour in Kenya to moderate that. Twitter doesn't have that. So at anymore. some point... Anymore. But even then, they have a few of them, but they're... They're on the way out. So I think that you're going to actually see so much worse coming up for this site. You already, you already look at the bottom of most posts and there is just a link with a picture of a fully nude woman. Mm -hmm. yes. It's insane. Uh, they, well, it's actually kind of, insane. They've taken over the platform. They, they, they run the platform now. The, the Pussy and Bio, it's the Pussy and Bio army is kind of how I feel about that. But um, it's gone from Pussy and Bio to just a straight up picture now. Yeah, because he got rid of all the bots. That was the that was the last. Oh, okay. One. Yeah, so it's a real woman. Great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just gonna go and respond to them real quick. Yeah, you you might as well. I think I think you're yeah. just uh, far more popular than you believe at this point. <laughs> there we go. As are we, we all. Love a guy who posts. <laughs> I was I was going to ask though with Elon Musk and, and basically the way it's gone. I get asked this all the time. How does it even still exist? Because the ad revenue has dropped by what, like 70 plus percent that we're talking billions of dollars. It's incredibly expensive, even in its current broken state to run something that has hundreds of millions of human beings interacting on it with video and, and everything else on a regular basis. How, how, how is it even still operational if, if the whole thing is literally bleeding money? It makes some money. 
but it makes enough, I think, to keep going, but also mm. is constantly burning. But also Elon Musk has a lot of cash. Mm. He has enough cash to keep this going for a couple years, maybe. But even then, he was he said at one point it was burning two, three million dollars a day. Yeah, around which there, works yeah. out, I think, to like nearly a billion a year. At some point, something has to stop this, though, because just like you said, it's expensive to run any website with this much traffic and pay all the people, which he does not like doing. But on top of that, the more broken it gets, the more expensive it gets, because I'm, I'm no engineer, but the basic things to know about server maintenance is you have people that exist to make it efficient, to make sure that you don't have things happening twice or three times or 150 times. All of these things cost money. He's fired all these people. He hasn't paying his bills. It will fall apart at some point. It's remarkable. I'm actually, I too am shocked that this thing's still, still rolling. Yeah, me as well. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about AI because um, sure. that's kind of, you know, right now's current NFT, uh, I feel. It's the big exciting thing in tech that uh, you have pretty much predicted is going to crash and burn uh, to historic proportions, I, I think is kind of your assessment. Am, am I fair in that? I think that's 50%. Okay. So generative AI, the latest boondoggle, and the current hype, the current boom, yeah, they're, they're going, like, that shit's falling apart. AI as a whole has been around for decades, which is actually kind of the reason why I think this boom will fade. Because I, I, sorry, I don't know if this is happening on your end. Right when you said that, it, uh, a thumbs up bubble popped a out of your up, mouth. And then my screen, my screen, your screen has screen now froze. frozen. Is that AI? Is great. <laughs> yeah, I think this is, a, I think this is, um, I think this is wokeness timing. and AI operating oh, nice. on me at that the That was the woke time. mind virus. Uh, yeah, the woke mind virus got me. Yeah. But yeah, so the generative AI boom, yeah, I think it's kind of falling apart because I just did an episode of this on my podcast, Better Offline, and I went through, there are four big problems. First yeah. of all, they're the obvious ones. So it costs a shit ton of money to run this stuff. Just, it is very expensive to run things like ChatGPT, Anthropics Claude, and all the varying branches. Like Microsoft basically owns um, OpenAI who mm. makes ChatGPT. So they have their own thing called Copilot, which is basically ChatGPT with a little bit of wonkiness at the side. <laughs> All of these things are extremely expensive to run. They're computationally expensive because both to make the models work, to train them, and the actual execution of commands, the more complex, even the simple ones, are made up on the spot. They're generative. So if you ask it what an elephant is 14 times, it's not going, well, I just answered that. Each time it's going, an elephant is this, an elephant is this. Some of them are getting rudimentary memory, but memory is also a very vague term. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, this stuff is super expensive, super duper expensive. Sam Altman is trying to make Microsoft build a $100 billion supercomputer to make this shit work. So that's super expensive. The other problem is it does not make any money. It doesn't make anywhere near as much money as it costs to run, and there does not appear to be a quick way to stop it from burning cash. There is a massive energy problem. So what, point 1.5 is really how much, how much it costs to make and also how little it makes anyone. Number two is the energy costs. Like ChatGPT, I think each day uses enough power for like 30, it's either 30,000 or 300,000 homes, neither of which is good. Uh, yeah. And they're building billions of dollars in new data centers to capture this demand. Number three is they're running out of training data. So you have, they fed it most of the internet. And uh, an expert I talked to, he said, no, sorry, that was a different bloke for the fourth point. An expert quoted in the journal said the chat GP, so GPT-5, the next generation of chat GPT, will require three or four or more times the information that, chat GPT, uh, that GPT-4 required, which is insane. Where, where did and they also get it? does not... Exactly. So they're considering something called synthetic data. Here's the fucking problem with synthetic data. There's a good paper, and this bloke I did talk to, there's a paper about model collapse, which is when you feed a generative AI data made by a generative AI, it inbreeds. It creates a degenerative learning process. Over the course of five or six generations, turns it into complete mincemeat. Mm -hmm. Does not work. As generative AI gets fed into generative AI, it becomes inbred. And uh, Jason Sadowski calls this Habsburg AI. I love it. 
think it's or, or the, best. the royal family yeah <laughs> no it really no it, and it's so funny as well because this is already goddamn happening <laughs> this is literally happening so that's why it was breaking speak. down right that's why the, that weird week well, went by where all of a sudden you see all those people like why is chat oh that was no one no one knows no one knows why that happened that that could be that could just be these things being dog shit okay and then there's the other problem hallucinations hallucinations are when these things authoritatively tell you something that isn't true in the mm -hmm. case of visual media it's when you see them with like 11 fingers or in sora the video generator you see it like a monkey with 18 arms you're like that's ah, horrible and they always say oh we'll get over this we'll fix this absolutely not this is a mathematical system you cannot change that you can mitigate hallucinations but i think i've read every single piece of media out there about hallucinations now and the only responses they have are what if we used another model to check whether the model was correct to be clear another generative model or what if we tell the model to not give us an answer if it's not sure about it these don't fix problems these don't fix problems at all and so then there's... when you wrap all of this up it's just not that useful it's not doing anything. Right. I know this sounds crazy, but it's not doing anything. It's no, not no, actually. Like, I'll, I'll, I'll say first and myself, like every, I think every other person, I'm totally over the idea that I, I could type anything I wanted and then type in a genre or a style and then see it. I was like, at first, that was neat. It was just like a new thing, right? It was like, oh, I've never seen an instant image yeah, be made out of the things like I was thinking. Like a calculator. Yeah, exactly. That, exactly. It's like seeing a calculator for the first time and, and thinking it was fancy. But, uh, but now, the thing you just brought up, Sora, I, I do think that there is an element, obviously, of the film industry that sees a way to be able to use other people's work or art or techniques and say, save a lot of money and there is obviously going to be massive savings if you can produce uh, a pixar quality animation in in literally minutes uh instead of hiring a full team and then just have one graphic artist go over it afterwards then that that is probably going to be a pathway forward for major corporations no well good news they can't do it the reason Why? you haven't seen sora used by the public is because if you think chat gpt is expensive sora is so much more but there's actually a few other problems First of all, it cannot fucking do it. It cannot do it. It's not able to... If you look at the videos that have come out of Sora, they're like 30 seconds long, one minute yeah, long. But they're running into the same hallucination problem. There's only so much it can do, but these models are not consistent. Something which is required in filmmaking. What if a bloke looks different between two shots? You think people are going to like that? But also, if you can't fix hallucinations, you cannot fix Sora, you cannot make anything with Sora. You might be able to, in the same way that ChatGPT is replacing dog shit SEO merchants who just spin up useless crap, like mm -hmm. generic crap, or stock image stuff. Yeah, it works if you're going to do that. But even with Sora, I'm not sure it can even do that. I'm not sure it's capable of actually creating two shots that look like each other. And that is dead in the goddamn water. When, and even that's if... before you get to the... Well, even if you use the previous shot to train the next one, even if you're like, use these parameters that I've set up and then make that same weird dog now jump on a house. Like, you don't think they'll ever be able so, to do that properly. You can't do that with it. It, it okay. just doesn't have that feature. Even if you give it literally the data to work off of, mm -hmm. the model, you as a user cannot train the model, but also training the model on one thing doesn't actually make it do. When you, it's kind of hard to conceptual, conceptualize, but when you ask someone to write a poem, that's a much simpler operation than generating a three-dimensional image that moves. Yeah, of course. So they did they, they had this whole thing where they had someone make this absolute crap video called uh, Balloon Head or Airhead. And it was a guy with a yeah, yellow so, balloon I, so, for so, a head. Yeah. <laughs> you look, every single shot, the balloon is a different size and shape. Hmm. Even one, like what, one and a half minute long movie, they couldn't make it look right. It was also very bad cinema, but putting the bad cinema part away... It didn't look good and it didn't look consistent. What are you replacing at this point? I think you could potentially replace like a crowd. I mean, Ted Lasso kind of did that. They had a, cr a crowd that they just kind of copy pasted, but it's already happening before this GPT stuff. Right. But also the biggest sign that sort of is dead in the water is they haven't launched it. They've been mm -hmm. claiming they'd launch it for months. They've been saying this thing's coming any day. But in an interview with the journal, Joanna Stern interviewing uh, Mira Murati, the CTO of OpenAI, that woman did not seem to know what the fuck was going on. She was just like, I'm 
I don't know if it was trained with YouTube. I don't know. But also, yeah, it's <laughs> good, I guess. They, they don't, they don't no, know she went, what they trained it on. So she made this face. She went, <laughs> I, go and look up the video. It looked exactly like that. Wow. She, when she was asked if it was trained on YouTube, she went and then said, uh, if it was publicly available, uh, yeah, that, it would be trained on that. And you could tell that she, I don't know how you don't prepare for the most obvious question ever. But yeah. also, that's the other problem. Disney, they don't really care if you're using ChatGPT or Dolly in this case to generate a picture of Mickey Mouse. If you then put that on something and then said, and here is Mickey Mouse, they will sue your ass into the ground. They will yeah. they will put you in the in the in the ground big time. They will take your estate, they'll shit shit in your mum's lap. However, <laughs> Joanna got them to generate something, a video for this Wall Street Journal piece, and they weren't ever giving direct access. And it generated a crab man. The crab man had a mustache, like Mr. Krabs from SpongeBob. And she noticed, she said, that's weird. I didn't say anything about a mustache. I would not be surprised if OpenAI hasn't just dumped, well, they have a deal with Shutterstock, first of all, but hasn't just dumped as much of YouTube as they could download. And if that's happened, this thing is dead on arrival. The music industry is litigious, but owned by like four companies. The massive amounts of money. I mean, Amazon owns MGM. Mm -hmm. They're gonna, f they, they alone will sue Sora into the ground. But also on top of that, it's too expensive. Mm -hmm. It's so, if it's already too, exp it's already horribly unprofitable to generate words and images. And they haven't been able to make it less unprofitable, really. But have you Video not been impressed by special. each each iteration? Because I, for one, like I, when I first saw the the initial images that were being generated, like they looked like nightmare fuel. The ones with all the eyes and lips and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. And then the next time I saw it, I was like, oh, they kind of look like Muppets. This looks like what the guy said it would look like. Oh. The one after that, it was like I saw SpongeBob doing 9/11. And and then after that, I was like, oh my god, Which, this looks like almost. So are you talking about images or video? I'm talking about images for this one, but the leap from images to video, the same things happened. When I first saw the uh, the video of, say, uh, what was it, Will Smith and the spaghetti, that's what I expected to see. I expected to see weird, alien, horrifying, hey, kitty, uh, horrifying shit. And then by the time Sora comes out, I, now I'm like, th this legitimately does look like film. I do right? not even, mean even this is an insult. Yeah, totally. This is how they want you to think about it. Damn it. This is, so the so right now, you're completely right. The jump from Dolly 1 to Dolly 2 was huge. Massive. And it yeah. is good. But you'll notice, it hasn't got better from there. They haven't fixed the real problems. It still can't do letters or words. No, it can't. It still can't do it can do the fingers right better. amount of fingers. The fingers are it less scary. Fingers They're not always like better, yeah. Yeah. but not perfect. Mm -hmm. It still can't do background imagery. And it has been stuck in amber since then. And that is a training problem. They don't have enough shit to feed it. And also, it's a mathematics problem. These are probabilistic models. When you tell it, I want a picture of a monkey, it doesn't know what a monkey is. It looks in its training data and it's the parameters it's learned from that training data and says, I think this is a monkey. It doesn't even say, I think it goes, well, a monkey. Monkey? Good. And that's why it kind of looks right, but doesn't look fully right. Mm -hmm. Video, again, is just yeah, it's so complex. echelons worse, but also... The thing that got Dali 1 to Dali 2 was money. It was OpenAI. When they released the first Dali, I think they had $40,000 of revenue. And they had not a time. They had the funding that Elon Musk gave them, which was much, like 90 million, 100 million, to get there. After that, they've got to like 2 billion in revenue, 1, 2 billion in revenue, but they're still unprofitable. They have. 13 billion in funding from Microsoft, except most of that is cloud credits just to run the thing. But also, they've used up all the data. They don't have anything more to train. Yeah, I, I, read, I read a story about them actually buying Tumblr data, even though Tumblr is like an almost dead yep. search engine because it was sorry, they, uh, a social media site because, they're again, they are desperate for anything. Like, well, they, uh, they have a deal with Automatic, who owns uh, Tumblr, WordPress, and something else. Uh, Shutterstock has done deals with tons of companies. Uh, Google just did a deal with Reddit. A lot of that's words, by the way. They need so many words, so many more words than they that have ever been written. But on top of that, again, visual data is just much more nuanced. It's contextual. It's social. There are tropes in design, and that's a separate field to art, that are different between states 
within a country, within regions of a country, within countries, within continents, and so on and so forth. And on top of that, you just need so much. You need so much more than they have. They've run out. They've, they have now, at this point, copied most of the internet, if not all of it. They have plagiarized so much. Uh, they told the House of, OpenAI told the House of Lords that it's impossible to make these models work without plagiarism. Hmm. And at some point, one of these lawsuits is going to work. Yeah. The moment one of these lawsuits goes through and they actually have to well, reveal that, their training data... That was, that was going to bring up my next one, music. Yeah. Because do you, does all this apply... Do you know about Suno too? Is, is Suno, Suno and the other one. Yeah, are, is, is it just as much of a Fugazi uh, magic trick that does nothing so, for you? For, for me, as someone who worked in music for a while, that's another one where I'm like, there's still something impressive about putting in a command prompt, a genre, and blah, 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 and then having it spit out a two-minute song in like 30 seconds, right? You're right. And I think that there is a delineation between impressive and useful. Right. It's you. It's cool that you can put together a song that sounds like it's the thing that they play between scenes in Married at First Sight. <laughs> it's very much reality TV music. Yeah, or but jingles still and commercials. Music. Yeah, it sounds like, a, like a good jingle, too. And that's the first one when I'm like, this is really going to take money out of people's hands. Okay. Because a lot of set musicians make a lot of money selling licensed music like that. Oh, of course. At scale. And yeah, the music kind of sucks, but so does the music used in that way. It's the same way that there are honest folk who do good SEO content, as in useful, utility-driven stuff, that are losing their job because ChatGPT can do 50% of what they do, and the people putting out that don't give a shit. Google doesn't care if SEO content's good, just care if it ticks boxes. Suno is interesting and also 100% the first one that's going to get sued to fucking ribbons. That's what I was You think thinking. any of the rights holders are going to sit there and be like, oh yeah, this is fine. Yeah, no, they're some of the most litigious companies in the world. But but how do you prove it? Because when you're mixing, let's say, 400,000 different data sets to make one song, and it's just like taking little fragments of each piece to be able to, you know, discover that mathematical? Okay. You, uh, UMG alone has a massive legal arm. I think they have a massive in-house team and multiple firms retained. They have the money and the inclination to burn through these companies and just force discovery. And once discovery happens and they're able to actually see the training data, because even if it, even if you use a bit of a song that they own to train a model, uh, yeah, it's still a bit of the song. They still own that. And also, OpenAI has a lot of money. Oh, does Suno, I forget where Suno gets them all. Suno does not have OpenAI's money either. They will get absolutely rolled. Same thing with Disney. That's the other thing killing Sora. Because Disney... They pay their chief legal officer, I think, $15 million a year? Like, just for him. He has hundreds of people, multiple firms, specialist copyright firms. So does UMG. Like, all of the music, big music companies, they're evil, but they're also the kinds of companies that could destroy these AI firms because they're not going to let this go. They're not going to be like, oh, you know, it's the future. Oh, maybe we can. No, they don't want that. Sure, that they're, the only thing they could possibly do is say, well, if we could own this, we could do this. But the truth is, this music isn't, it isn't actually the stuff that will sell. It's not but they, good. But they can't have it both ways, right? Because doesn't Disney already use AI art in some of its projects? And they've stated that they want to start using more AI in their actual work. So aren't they at this juxtaposition? You can't both be using when they have this said... and, and also copyright it. So, I... um. I will say this, if Disney is talking about using AI, it's important to remember that Disney said they were entering the metaverse. Warner Brothers, same shit. They will jump on whatever trend makes the stock pop, even if it doesn't really work. Sure, all of these companies, if they had an easy way to cut human beings out and just sell their own stuff, absolutely. But because they've made no effort to attribute anything in this training data, they've not tried to make deals because obviously the companies would have said, eat my asshole you can't do that we're not going to yeah. do that but also disney's been using i ju just looked this up in real time disney's been using ai for a long time most companies oh, yeah have most been. yeah mo most well that's i used to work in the film industry so i know that there's versions of what people think is ai because ai is such a you know as you know massive term that people think is everything from sentient computers to uh these like calculators but there there's like a lot of software even people who use photoshop and were using it a decade ago know about something called content aware fill 
where you just you select anything, you hit the content aware fill, and then it automatically makes the background look identical to as if you had taken something out of the picture. And that's using right. the same systems, right? It's basically approximating pixel by pixel what's the closest to look like I've replaced your thing. That's a lot we're just doing now on the cloud is essentially how I see this, right? It's it's using massive data sets to try and approximate what people are searching for is the closest to it. So in that and sense, that, they're going to keep using that, right? Or, or just sure, keep... but also, I don't think that people are going to want to buy AI-generated content. I don't think someone is going to... I think people are pissed off at tech in general, but also, I just think if, if I was told, hey, this is generated by an AI, I would feel defrauded, and I think a lot of people would. Oh, people will buy crap, don't... Don't get me yeah, wrong. I'm, I'm the same one on YouTube. Do you ever click on videos about a show or something, and then within 30 seconds, you're like, oh, god damn, this is AI. Yeah, and I'm listening to AI Kevin Costner someone... read out a G chat GPT script or something Exactly. Like that. <laughs> That's a whole different problem. That's the real problem that AI is creating. But also, there's no money in any of this. It's not affordable. It's not profitable. Oh, hello. My dog's um, paying really close attention to all of this. Right? He's just in the corner. He's, he's <laughs> absolutely entranced. <laughs> Deeply um, enthralled. <laughs> All of this stuff doesn't make money and it's not good or reliable enough to replace human beings. No one has really replaced human beings yet other than the transcription and translation industries. Okay. And at some point there's going to be a problem there. The transcript industry, are really they're the ones who are really fucked because most people there don't actually want... They don't actually care about the quality of a transcription. They care about the text and having an idea of what it's said. You're not really... If you need... If you need a transcription done for a court thing, you are paying a human being to do it. But otherwise, it's just like, it's good enough. Mm -hmm. It's fine. And that, those people are really in trouble. Same with translation services. They are, again, it's a race to the bottom. They don't care about nuance. Most people don't care about nuance. When it comes to creative stuff, you can also kind of tell. I'm so not far, saying though, this. But that's, that's, I feel at this point, and then uh, if you're so saying was, we've we've reached the zenith because there's no more data to, to pull from, that's then, actually then I, what I was about to say. Yeah. Then, then so okay. if you look, so you know the way that I don't know. It's kind of a vague point, but you know how all of it kind of looks a certain way. Yeah. There's a certain a shininess to it. to it. Yeah. Yes, exactly. A, pla a plastic exactly. film on some things. That's weird. Exactly. So the reason that that happens is because they're all trained on the same data sets. They all steal the same shit. That's how it is. There is not enough data to make it nuanced. There's not enough data to make it special. And what's crazy is, yeah, you're right. There are some things that look real. They absolutely do. But they look real in a very certain way. They're framed. You can really tell by the framing. There's a weird kind of perfect rule of thirds look to it. Mm -hmm. Once you kind of see it, you're like, oh, I, I don't like that. Even when you put aside the hallucinations, which are there most of the time, it has this kind of echoey feel to it. And past that, to get past that, I mean, you need to be able to feed it lots of nuanced data. Even if you give it 100,000 images, I don't actually, I think that's a drop in the bucket. They need so much more. They need millions of images. They probably need hundreds of millions of hours of footage. I think Adobe is now paying people to take video of people walking around. <laughs> but the problem is, another thing with video is, you think that people are demanding when it comes to, like, visual media, you, when it comes to, like, photos and such. People, but people can kind of get past that. When you're watching something intently, which is just very different to how we look at images, when you're watching a movie and something is off, most people can see that and most people feel unsettled. When lighting changes, when people change, when people are wearing something slightly different, when a cup is out of place. Now imagine that effect, but in the background you can see two people walk up to each other and then they become one and they split again. Or the car behind a person is a different car when it comes out from behind the person. These things may be happening once, you wouldn't notice them, but contiguously over a few minutes you're going to just say, this, this doesn't look right. And it's weird, it makes you feel bad, no one likes it. But also, it's not quicker. It may mm -hmm. seem quicker, but if it's this shit and every single one has to be mediated and mitigated, it's not going to be much less effort. It's definitely not going to replace wa people walking around. You notice that we still have extras in stuff. 
You don't think they would have got... They're trying to get rid of them with, with AI, but it's not working. Because people notice when people aren't real. People can spot fake shit really easily. Now, of course, you could say, well, what about uh, 3D generated stuff? Same problem, except slightly worse. Because 3D generated images are generally clearer and easier to notice the definition thereof. So if something was off, you'd really see it. If Mr. Incredible had three arms, you'd see that. Yeah. But also, if they have trained on Disney stuff, if they've trained on any Disney stuff, Disney will sit there and set up shop in Sam Altman's asshole. They're not going to back off. There is no, there's no deal where Sam Altman is going to pay them. And Disney's going to be like, yeah, sure, use all our stuff. God, no. Goodness. It was a landmark deal when Disney came to the Apple Store. It took years. Years and years and years, they didn't want to do it. They were like, no, we want to control the... When they still kind of control the Blu-ray market. Mm -hmm. Streaming, they made their own platform. It took them ages to get to Apple TV. These are things where... These are more indicative of the future than anything that's happened to AI. Right. Do you think it's going to do the same thing as crypto? Do you think... Because, like, people say that crypto... and Like, NFTs, you can demonstrate that they're kind of valueless to, to nothing now. But crypto just didn't go away, despite the fact that, the t like, the adoption or the tech industry touting crypto and Web 3.0 did. So do you think the AI will have a similar fate? Ironically, I think that crypto found a very narrow use case in the ETFs. Just another thing for asset managers to sell people was useful. But on top of that... Crypto kind of has gone away. It isn't getting funded anymore. It isn't the liquidity in the market, even with Bitcoin at 60 grand. If you wanted to shift more than like a billion dollars, then it wouldn't work. Like you, you just, the, the market would crash. There is not the liquidity in the market. So wait, even though crypto is, is back to being unbelievably valuable, it's also simultaneously dead? Or do you just mean there'd be no more adoption of it? Or it's not You can't to really it? interact with the market at the scale that most stocks do. It just does not accept it. When Sam Bankman-Fried's whole empire was falling apart, he threatened to sell $250,000 of Tether, and they freaked out. That suggests far more that the money behind this thing, the amount of real money is maybe three, four, five billion dollars $5 maybe 10 which is not that much. No. It means that you, the market might be worth hundreds of mil billions of dollars or over a trillion, but the actual ability to action that is much lower. Hmm. So is that something that all the whales are aware of? And then they just... Yes. Okay. That's why a lot of them do trailing sales over time. Or they find ways to do over-the-counter sa sales directly to someone rather than selling directly into the market. Um, last thing I want to ask you, what comes after AI? What's the next hot ticket? What should we all be investing our, our doubloons into? So that's the thing. I think AI is going to stick around for another year or two, but when it collapses, it'll be nasty. I think that they're going, there's going to be, even though saying this means nothing, I think there is going to be a quantum compute boom. Faster, bigger, stronger, better. It's the thing that NVIDIA could pivot to. I think the AI boom is really going to hurt tech as a whole. I think it's going to make people even more suspicious of a tech industry they already didn't like. And I think that it's going to be hard for them to find another doodad. Because the tech industry, as you look at it, has not really innovated meaningfully in like five to ten years. What was the last really useful thing that tech invented? Alexa? <laughs> New iPhone? Vision yeah, Pro? I was, I was Vision Pro, I have one. I was kind of, <laughs> it's interesting, but it's not the future. Well, yeah. that's the thing. The money hasn't been going into innovation for some time. It's been going into growth. It's been going into what can we shift to who. And I think that when this falls down, there is going to be a shift back to trying to build shit again. Or you're going to see one of the major platforms collapse. I think Twitter will be the first to go. I know this sounds crazy. This is my real conspiracy theory thing. Oh, I love it. Please. Please. Alex Jones out for us. Well, the, the <laughs> yeah. I think Facebook can die. I think Facebook could die, and I think it could die in the next 10 years. I don't think Facebook is a useful product anymore. I think they're running out of people who will join it. I don't think it offers a service anymore. Isn't that in the and West, think, though? Isn't it really mass adopted in places like India and other countries? Where it's WhatsApp like seen, is. Okay, WhatsApp. But not, but not That's, but I mean, Facebook. it has adoption. Just to be clear, like the Philippines is a huge thing. Also yeah. a huge scam market for them. Yeah, I know. But also, traffic has been 
kind of slowly growing, but then kind of plateauing. And yeah. as that happens, Meta is put in a weird situation where they'll try and squeeze more money out of it. They'll make it even worse than it is today. And that will in turn make the platform. And at some point, user, users are going to drop because there's only so many human beings. Now, mm -hmm. Facebook has got plenty of money behind it, so it will stick around a while. But when you see Facebook or Instagram, if you see their users drop two consecutive quarters, the end has begun. Oh, because wow. there is no, there's no more ability for these platforms to grow. There's no new channels. Zuckerberg has yet to create a useful, good product. Instagram stories is the last thing that Mark Zuckerberg came up with. Reels as well. These are just ripoffs of other products. Everything Facebook has done that's good is stolen. Stolen. Acquired. I'm sorry. That's not stealing. <laughs> that's buying. Um, WhatsApp, Instagram, Oculus. Oculus is like a dead thing it's just dead like there's there's nothing it's selling all right like it's not profitable they're still claiming they're doing the metaverse i think meta though they're very profitable now i think they're the weakest tech company out there they're the ones with the shittiest product they're the ones with the arguably the weakest c-suite boz is a fucking idiot so is adam adam Sari is one of the dumbest men alive i'd love to get him on my show i'll rip him i'll bounce him a across the fucking wall. I've always wanted an argument with that guy. He's open open him. offer right now. <laughs> so if you really want to know the people to be angry at, it's a good place to rap, actually. The people to be angry at. Adam Masseri, he is the reason okay. Instagram's bad. Prabhakar Raghavan, Sundar Pichai at Google. They are the people that turned Google search into a pile of shit. And really, Jack Dorsey. Jack Dorsey could have stopped everything that happened on, at Twitter. He could have absolutely held back the tide. He is worth billions of dollars. He does not fear Elon Musk. Instead, he helped him. He helped him out. These people deserve Uriah. They're the real villains, especially Prabhakar Raghavan and Sundar Pichai. Like, Google should be a public utility. It should, be, it should not be a profit-seeking company. But these people all have names. These people all deserve your ire, and I think that more people should be angry about them and saying their names. Mm -hmm. Instead of always Elon Musk. Instead of always Elon Musk. Because he's very bad, but he is a certain kind of bad that's more comparable to private equity than it is to the tech industry. Yeah. He's also just a, he's just full of shit. Yeah, he is just it, a, he his is friend a, facing he is, white supremacists. Easy to, to point towards kind of He's guy. easier to point, and also, it's much easier, and justifiable. Jewish myself, I'm fucking disgusting. Fucking disgusting, the shit he said. But also, Israel should stop killing fucking Palestinians, Jesus Christ. Anyway, um, either way, Elon Musk, he's just more garish. You can point and go, he did this. It's ugly. It's horrible. You can see the dumb decisions he made with the product. You can see the moronic things he's done, the Cybertruck. That's the Model 3 with the weird screen in the middle. Or self-driving. All these things are very obvious and ugly and bad, and you can fucking be mad at them. Prabhakar Vagravan and Sundar Pichai, they're death by a thousand cuts. That's something that started in decade ago but really it was like 2019 when ben gomes i believe his name was issued something called a code yellow which is a very funny thing sounds like you peed himself um saying that google their search product had got too close to the ads product at google less than a year later prabhagar ragavan took over and what was his old job he was the head of ads at google that's the guy running search. It's so cool. I love it. It's the best. <laughs> oh, wow. boy. So yeah, angry. That... <laughs> I, mean, I was, I was going to ask you, what do you do to stay sane, Ed, in amongst all I, I lift. I work, I work out. I play uh, endless rookie mode MLB The Show. I'm actually not quite that angry because there's almost nothing you can do. But also, I like the writing helps. Being able to actually put this down in words and make it clear how I feel actually helps me find some peace with it. Well, that's good. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, kind of, where can everyone kind of feels find like you, Ed? narrating uh, the end of the world. <laughs> anyway. Blo blogging it on Substack. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Ghost now. Oh, sorry, Ghost. Yeah, because I don't... I, yeah, Substack, yeah, another Nazi appreciator. Yeah, I, yeah, it's not, not too great. Oy. But where, where can people find your Ghost? Where can they find your links and, and, and so subscribe? So where's and your ed dot at? is good so you can go there you can also go to betteroffline.com and you'll find the podcast the newsletter and all that good shit thank you so much for coming on absolutely fascinating to talk to you and you're you're a lot funnier than i thought you would be <laughs> considering I'm how bleak your articles are <laughs> like... nah, you got you got to have a light heart about this stuff thank you for having me it's been a pleasure 
Absolute pleasure. Bye, Ed. Bye. Everyone, go subscribe or follow or or do a thing for Ed Zitron and uh, and follow his work because he's uh, he's absolutely fascinating. Uh, I, I if you haven't already read it, I would go check out the Rod Economy. Probably uh, a really good place to get started. Uh, I think it was Matt Binder or maybe uh, it's probably one of those uh, many Robert uh podcast i'm always promoting it could happen here maybe he was on one of those episodes but i was like i was i remember listening to him and being like oh wow this guy's actually really neat to talk to because like anyone who talks about ai i feel is either mind poisoned in one direction or another there's people who want to have like an actual holy war against just ai technology without i don't even think understand they're just like this is literally the death of humanity the death of art is happening before our eyes i'm like it's just it's just really expensive servers and calculators i think it's disgusting what people are trying to suggest doing with it i'll, I'll agree with you there i mean i think if you're going to just try and replace a whole bunch of people's jobs with like the finger army you know then then yeah that's kind of that's kind of weird but um yeah it, he actually he actually knew way more about what he was talking about so i i found it to be uh illuminating and enthralling and and educational on top of everything else Thank you so much for watching, everybody. We first want to give a shout out to everyone who makes this show possible. This program is produced thanks to the generous support of our Patreon supporters. Anna Loves Riley, Arian McCarthy, Cheryl Alvarez, Comrade Junkie, Doug Caddy, Everything Important, Hegbar Celine, Jimmy Sombrero, Multi Mondi, Omni, Peanut Butter Blondie, Political Poppy, Preston Kroll, Quite 185, Richard Bomey, Riley and Anna, Roller Dragon, Ruby, Cernicus, Stellar Gwynn, Sebastian Demmel, Travis McClinton, and Words Greenwood. As well as every other person you see on the screen right now, this show would not be possible without them. And if you want to join these wonderful people who make this entire program possible, simply go to patreon.com slash the service and you can unlock uncensored and bonus episodes and, you know, help us exist.